Thanks for joining us on Capitol View. I'm Fred Martino. Up front this week, a look back at the legislative session and a look ahead to some additional priorities. We are so pleased to welcome Representative Sue Scherer to Capitol View. Representative, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for having me today. Good to have you. Good to have you here. Let us, let's start with the legislative session. What a busy uh, time it was and uh, your thoughts on the biggest accomplishments this year. Um, you know what, this was a wonderful session. We really did uh, get a lot accomplished. There have been years that it was not so good. Uh, you know, I was here when we went maybe three years without a budget. That was horrific. Um, but some really great accomplishments that I think came out of this year, having been a teacher for 35 years in the public schools, education to me is a top priority, obviously, but it's not just all about education. Education ripples into the economy and jobs and people working and raising families and being educated. So all those things being said, this was really a banner year for education. We really um, put our money where our mouth is this time and put money in from cradle to college. What that means is a huge Smart Start program, which is for children in preschool. And one of the main things there is we're really pouring money into the preschool programs and in addition to that, we poured money in the millions, extra funding into child care, um, actually a hundred million extra dollars into child care so that parents who want to and uh, need to go to work are able to get assistance with their child care. Um, another thing is um, we did a lot of of job training that we haven't done in the past. So a lot of money went into MAP grants for colleges. We fully funded K through 12 education. Um, the MAP grant thing's a big deal to me because I was a recipient of a MAP grant. It had a different name back in the day, but it's the same thing. And um, you know, the state has more than got their money's worth out of that and the money that people like I have paid in taxes on the back end from that. So I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, my heart was broken when we quit funding our universities and MAP grants. So we are really upping the game, trying to get people to go to college at state universities. And then, you know, the, the records show that then they come back, they live here, they stay here, they work here, they pay taxes here, and it grows our economy. Um, so I'm really happy with where we've landed on education. Another really tremendous accomplishment I feel is that we have totally addressed the problem of retaining teachers and getting new teachers. Now, I don't know if this is gonna solve it, but we are sure gonna try. For the next three years, we are giving schools that are in hard hit districts that don't have teachers in classrooms. We have funded that to the tune of, I think, $40 million for the state. Uh, I know in my district uh, combined, it's well over a million dollars for the S Springfield and Decatur Public Schools, which are the two school districts I represent, and um, Harris Town as well in there. But anyway, um, they have this money and they can choose to spend it however they see fit. So for once, the state isn't getting in there and telling you what to do as a local school district. We're saying, you know your district, you come up with whatever the people need to come there and teach. So it can be, they can give them bonuses, they can give them signing bonuses, they can pay for their housing, they can pay moving expenses, they can pay childcare. They can literally do pretty much anything they want. They do report back to us what they did with the money um, so it is accountable, but we're, we're empowering local school boards to decide what they think could really work to get teachers in their classrooms. It's a three year program and we're going to see how this works. So I'm very excited about that. 
Um, another huge thing is that our bond rating has gone up eight steps just in this year. We are now an A-rated state. And back in the years when we had didn't have a budget, we were one step above junk bonds. That's true. Okay. So a lot of a lot of important things, and we will uh, we'll talk more about education uh, specifically in the half hour ahead. I want to move on now to some of the most important issues that you're still working on for the next year. Okay, I've got uh, right now. I have two really huge ones. Well, three really. So uh, one of my main things, and I don't know if you um, got the press release. It just actually went out last night. And I did. <laughs> about the insurance. Yes. Uh, so let me talk about the other two quick, because they're quicker to talk about. So one is I uh, have put in a bill uh, to help Decatur Public Schools. They had uh, two of their buildings got condemned and the students had nowhere to go. So we need to change the law in what we do when there is a crisis closure because it's not spelled out real well. And so uh, that's one of my bills that I hope to get passed during veto is to help with Decatur Public School situation and have it work for the current school year to help that these kids don't have to go to school two weeks late in the summer uh, next, you know, next June. Um, another one that I'm still working on is trying to get the funding for free breakfast and lunch for our students. It's just heartbreaking um, for kids to come to school and, you know, that might be the only thing they eat in a whole day's time. And yet we test them to death and publish those scores in the paper and nobody knows what their lives are like at home. Um, but then my third and probably biggest to some people, you know, I always said, whatever the bill is, if it affects you directly, that's the most important thing to you. It may not be important to others, but if you're struggling with your insurance companies right now and uh, ghost networks, I have dusted off the bill that I ran, uh, I think it was two years ago. It's an over hundred page bill, colossal, written by the Department of Insurance and the governor's office. And we're going to try again to pass that. And we need to figure out a way to hold our large health insurance companies accountable. I get calls constantly. I, I don't have a doctor. Uh, you know, they say I have a doctor. They list all these doctors. I call them. They're like in Chicago or they're not taking new patients. Well, that's not really allowed to be on that list. So we call those things ghost networks, and we've got to do a better job of holding these companies accountable. So this is going to be the biggest bill that I'll be carrying. It would be marvelous if I could get that passed in veto session. Okay, let's talk about veto session. That's coming up this fall. Uh, what are the major issues in addition to the one that you just mentioned? Well, I feel like the the main thing with veto this time, I hope, are going to be my two bills. I really, you know, want to get this insurance bill passed, and I really want to get this uh, emergency school closure bill passed. To me, those are both very timely, and they need to be going right to the top of the of the list for veto session. Veto okay. session has kind of got two purposes. One is uh, for things like this that come up that are like emergencies that need to be taken care of before regular session. And the other one is uh, if the governor did veto anything from the spring session to override the vetoes. Yeah. As you mentioned, a Representative, you were a public school teacher for more than 30 years. You've already talked about a number of education issues uh, where you've had success, others where you're, you're still working to get things passed. We've talked about a number of priorities. Uh, I want to move to one that you haven't talked about yet, and that is the opportunity for dual credit, earning college credit while you're still in high school. 
What an amazing uh, opportunity this is. Tell me uh, your thoughts on these programs and would you like to see these expand? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts on these. Um, I'm going to go back to when I entered college and there were um, my peers came and there they walked in the door with all these credits called CLEP credits. Indicator, we knew nothing even about CLEP credits. So, you know, my friends and I from Decatur walk in with zero credits. They're walking in with eight, 10, 12 credits before the their college even begins. And some of those were some of their hardest classes. So, you know, it really was an unfair start right from the beginning. But I will say this, I learned right out of the gate that, you know, things aren't fair and equal. And that if you're from the suburbs, you had a much greater advantage before you even walked in the door. So now I love the idea of dual credits. My own children all were able to get dual credits. And it's interesting because, you know, I have four kids and from the oldest down to the youngest, my first child had, I think, six hours of dual credit, maybe even only three. And by the, that was my oldest daughter. By the time I got to my youngest child, uh, Tyler, he was able to get, oh gee, he either had 12 or 15 credits uh, before he even went to UIS. So um, there's so many advantages to that. A, the money that you don't have to pay for all those classes, and we know how expensive college is. B, you get right out of the gate, um, you know, you know, here's one of the, I think, most important things. You know you can do it. I remember being scared when I went to college. I was afraid that I wouldn't be smart enough to be successful. And that was because no one in my family had ever gone to college. How would I know if I could do it or not? You know, and I ended up being on the dean's list. But that was a very real fear for me. Now, when my kids went to school, they didn't have that fear because I could tell them my experience, but not everybody gets to have that. So now if you have dual credit, you can go and you can be like, I know I can do it. I have already gotten an A or a B in all these different classes. So now I know that I can handle it. Um, and not only that, but when you go to register for classes, you don't go in as a zero freshman, zero credit, you go in ahead of all the freshmen with zero credit. So it's a much greater chance that you'll get the classes you need at a decent time and you're not paying extra money taking classes you don't even need just so that you're a full-time student. We'll have more of my interview with Representative Sue Scherer next week and we wanna hear from you. Send us your letters. The email address is contact at WSIU.org. Analysis now, and we welcome Jeremy Gorner of the Chicago Tribune and Charlie Wheeler, Emeritus Director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the University of Illinois Springfield. Thank you both for being with us today. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you. Good to have you both. Jeremy, I see that a gun industry group is challenging the new firearms marketing restrictions in Illinois. Tell us about this. Yes. Um, so uh, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, they're a gun trade organization, obviously. Um, and, uh, you know, they filed this lawsuit two days after uh, Governor Pritzker um, signed it into law. Basically, what this law is supposed to do is that it allows anyone to sue uh, gun manufacturers or gun dealers if, um, you know, the, you know, for uh, shoddy marketing ploys. So basically, um, if it's found that these gun dealers or manufacturers, anyone in the firearm industry is mark are marketing to children or um, marketing in such a way which make it easier for um, illegal sales to um, occur, such as straw purchasing. Um, and then, you know, such marketing ploys may directly or indirectly lead to um, lead to gun violence. Um, then those victims of gun violence can sue the firearm industry um, because of, you know, their marketing. 
um, of said firearms. Now, um, this has been, you know, even when this was on the Senate floor, I know that um, it was even even in committee, it was warned by opponents of um, namely gun rights advocates that uh, this law could be contested in court because um, there's federal law that actually protects gun manufacturers and um, and gun and, and, and gun sellers um, from such lawsuits, basically, because um, I mean, specifically a 2005 federal law that, uh, um, you, you know, that basically exempts them from lit litigation, regardless of how they market their weapons um, and so on and so forth. But you have the Democrats, uh, notably Senate President Don Harmon, who have said that they're complying with federal law with this, um, you know, you know, you know, with this new law that was passed, you know, on the state level. Mm -hmm. However, the um, NSSF, uh, of course, begs to differ, saying it violates the First Amendment and, um, you know, among just a whole host of uh, of other problems, basically. First yeah. Amendment, basically, is as well as the Second Amendment, you know, were both cited in, in one lawsuit, which is interesting because, you know, of all the gun rights litigation that we've seen, you know, especially with the assault weapons ban, we've seen the Second Amendment being contested, not the First Amendment and the Second Amendment at the same time. So, um, so yeah, so that's basically what's at play here. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see uh, what the courts say about this. Another interesting one, Charlie, uh, is an effort by Illinois on gun safety being challenged in a different way. The Illinois Supreme Court has upheld the state's assault weapons ban, but a federal test does remain. Tell us about this. Yes, well, a week or so ago, the Illinois Supreme Court ruled four to three to uphold the assault weapon ban. It's called the Protect Illinois Communities Act. And its history is interesting in that it was passed on the very last day of, in, in January of the prior General Assembly and it was passed basically overnight and signed almost immediately. And that was one of the objections raised uh, at, at the time of its passage. The challenge was brought by uh, Representative Dan Calkins, who's a, a Republican from Decatur, and a Macon County judge said, yes, this, this law is unconstitutional. It was appealed directly to the Supreme Court and in the Supreme Court ruling, and as I say, it was four to three, and they upheld the law. And uh, and I'm going to quote from the opinion here, uh, is written by Justice Elizabeth Rochford, who is the daughter of a former Chicago police superintendent. And she says, first, we hold that the exemptions, because the law exempted certain people, uh, law enforcement folks, military people, security guards, folks in those categories, we hold that the exemptions neither deny equal protection nor constitute special legislation because plaintiffs have not sufficiently alleged that they are similarly situated and treated differently from the exempt classes. Second, plaintiffs expressly waived in the circuit court any independent claim that the restrictions impermissibly infringe the Second Amendment. Third, plaintiffs' failure to cross appeal is a jurisdictional bar to renewing their three readings claim. Uh, accordingly, we reverse the circuit court inter judgment for defendants on the equal protection and special legislation claims. We express no opinion on the potential viability of plaintiff's waived claim concerning the Second Amendment. Ah, very interesting. And so this, this, this well, now we'll have to see if this, that's the state Supreme Court. We'll have to see if the uh, U.S. Well, Supreme that's, Court that's is interested that's what in waiting for now because the, uh, the federal courts in, in the Southern District, there's been suits filed contesting this on Second Amendment grounds, among others. Mm -hmm. And on June 29th, a three-judge panel of the 7th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals heard oral arguments in six consolidated lawsuits challenging the ban on grounds that violated the Second Amendment. The court has not issued a ruling yet but the the gun advocates say well it's pretty clear that when the ruling comes down uh this law is going to get tossed and mm. i would say obviously whatever the the circuit court of appeals says 
it will be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, and that's where the final resolution will come. Yeah, that's what we're going to all be, be watching very carefully. And of course, not only in Illinois, but all, all across the country, because certainly uh, with, with a lack of federal uh, action in, in most cases, uh, states are taking action. So that's really where uh, the effort is on, on gun safety, something we'll be talking about on this show, I'm sure, for years to come. Jeremy, I want to move to the veto session coming up this fall. Governor J.B. Pritzker has vetoed a measure granting Ameren authority over transmission line construction. What is this all about? So basically, um, you know, so first of all, it's pretty rare. It's been up till um, this past spring session, it's pretty rare for the governor to um, uh, veto any bills. I think, the and, and Charlie, please correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, the last one I remember prior to this session was, um, I believe it was, uh, you know, early 2022 or perhaps around that time he vetoed a bill related to um you know the school vaccine mandates you know so it's it's first of all just to paint a picture it's, it's pretty rare for the governor to do this in general but in this case um you know he vetoed a measure it would grant existing um utility companies particularly downstate notably Ameren, illinois um the quote right to to first refusal of transmission line um construction now basically um what this would do is give Ameren, um, you know, authority to build new transmission lines without going through a competitive um, bidding process under um, federal um, regulations. Um, and so the governor issued basically an amendatory veto. He only struck, you know, struck down a portion of this bill dealing with that right to refusal um, for um, transmission line construction. Um, and he left the rest of the bill you know, of the bill untouched, basically. So um, this is going to be something that's, I think, you know, going to be pretty contested. I know that um, Larry Walsh, he's a, uh, you, you know, he was the chief sponsor in the House, um, you, you know, you know, pushing, trying to push this bill through the House. It um, passed with, I believe, three votes to spare in the House, um, uh, you know, during the spring session. And he says he's going to try to passed the bill over the governor's objection during veto session um, anyway. Um, he stressed that the bill he sees as it as being beneficial to laborers. In his view, the bid process opens up um, transmission line construction okay. for out-of-state companies. Um, All right. Well, we only have a few minutes left, and there is another veto I want Charlie to talk about where, again, just like that veto, we may see action on this in the veto session. Governor Pritzker vetoed a bill that would have allowed new nuclear plant construction. Charlie, give us an update on that. Yeah, well, the this was legislation that came through this, this past spring session, and it basically removes a provision in law that was put in, I believe, in 1987 that says that there can be no nuclear construction in Illinois until the federal government figures out what to do with the waste from uh, nuclear power generation, the spent fuel rods, and there's something like, Lord, like 11,000 tons of them up at the closed plant in Zion, and the stuff has a half-life, some of it of 24,000 years. And so the, the idea is that they are developing a new kind of reactor, a small modular reactor, they're called, instead of these big, huge, massive structures that you may be seeing. And the idea is to encourage these. And so we, we lifted the ban and Pritzker seemed supportive back in the spring. And he said, well, the devil's in the details. Well, he looked at the details of this particular bill and he says, and this is from his veto message, there appears to be real potential for small modular reactors, which in the future could safely provide energy for energy consuming businesses in area where their needs cannot currently be met. However, he says, this bill provides no regulatory protections for the health and safety of Illinois residents who would live and work around these new reactors. And the vague definitions in the bill, including the overly broad definition of advanced reactors, will open the door to proliferation of large-scale nuclear reactors that are so costly to build that they will cause exorbitant ratepayer-funded bailouts. 
And mm. so he vetoed it because he he didn't like it. Now the the margins by which it's passed in the General Assembly were sufficient to uh, have an override, but the sponsor of the of the bill, Senator Sue Resin, a, a Morris Republican, told a local radio station that she's heard that the as was indicated that that the House is not going to go along with it. She's filed the paperwork, but she doesn't think it's going to go anywhere. Meanwhile, the governor is talking about, well, maybe we can get together and do something more along the lines of what I was talking about, these small modular ones rather than the huge ones and putting proper guardrails. Yeah, that's going to be really interesting to see. That seems to be uh, something that there is an, an interest in some kind of a negotiated settlement on that. So we'll be watching it during the veto session. As usual, uh, Jack Titchener will be here with uh, a variety of different programs uh, covering the veto session. Well, my guests today were Jeremy Gorner of the Chicago Tribune and Charlie Wheeler, Emeritus Director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the University of Illinois Springfield. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. All right, and thank you at home as well. For all of us at WSIU, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week.